Uh, good evening. Uh, I, I, I'm Tim O'Shea. I'm the, the, the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. Um, a warm uh, welcome to this year's Enlightenment Lecture. It's part of a very successful series of public lectures on our changing world, uh, which is a major public engagement exercise for the university. And we're now in the, the fourth year of that. Uh, that series has seen distinguished academics from within the university discussing many of the global challenges that face society, including atmospheric carbon and climate change, renewable energy and sustainable technologies, the challenges and opportunities for medicine from understanding the human genome and advances in stem cell research. And in that regard, it's very nice to see Serene Wilmot sitting in, in the front row um, tonight. Um, the lectures have highlighted the importance of interdisciplinary research and scholarship in meeting these global challenges and the excellent world-leading research in these areas that are taking place here. So for the regular lectures, uh, we've had about 250 to 300 uh, members of the public, and over some 30 of these lectures are available to view online, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, but one of the key things about the Changing World lectures are the, the basis of an interdisciplinary course for our first year undergraduates, which in introduces them to global challenges and the role of university research in the global context. And this new course is part of the university's strategic aim to introduce sustainability and global into awareness into all our teaching. Um, the course itself has been very successful. It's got various spin-offs, uh, one of which is a, a MOOC, a massive open online course on global health and critical thinking, uh, which reached an audience of 75,000 online. Um, we're really indebted uh, to professors Gareth Lang and Manak Duccia in the School of Biomedical Sciences, who've shown um, extraordinary leadership in getting this uh, important series off the ground. Uh, tonight, we're really privileged. Uh, we're going to be addressed for our big enlightenment lecture, which, if you like, is the star on the Christmas tree of the Changing World series. Uh, Lord, um, Lord Winston, who is Professor of Science and Society and Emeritus Professor of Fertility Studies at Imperial College, um, is going to be talking. He's world-renowned and widely respected expert in human fertility. He's very well known as the author of many popular science books and for his series of award-winning BBC programs, which include the human body, the secret life of twins, and superhuman. And Robert Winston is a wonderful person uh, because he's a massively successful scientist, and he's also a really jolly, friendly person. Um, his extensive contributions to clinical medicine include the development of gynecolog gynecological microsurgical microsurgery, surgery, and in vitro fertilization techniques and groundbreaking research which pioneered techniques in the transfer of germ cells between males. He's also the ch now the chairman of the Genesis Research Trust, a charity which funds important research into women's health and fertility. Um, as I said, he combines being a massively distinguished scientist uh, with a tremendous role in public awareness, uh, past president of the British Association and holder of the Michael Faraday Medal from the Royal Society. <coughs> which is given for excellence in communicating science uh, to UK audiences. So the, as I said, we normally have an audience of about 300. I'm delighted uh, that we've got 1,000 people tonight. Uh, entirely appropriate. Uh, so please me, join me in welcoming Lord Winston. I said this before, uh, Principal, that um, I remember once showing my CV to my very austere Scottish professor who had actually been to this university, John McClure Brown, and he, um, he went through my CV before I was applying for a job and went down it with his pencil bit by bit and finally he looked up at me before I posted it and he said over his half moon glasses, well, Winston, when I read my CV, I don't recognize myself either. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
This woodcut by Nicholas Hartzerker was published round about the late end of the 17th century. And it is, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, woodcut, I think, to biologists because it shows what Nicholas Hartzerker thought he could see down the microscope. You'll remember, of course, that the person who was pioneering microscopy in Holland at the time was Van Leeuwenhoek, a name that's very famous. And the story goes that Hartzerker went to visit Van Leeuwenhoek with his single lens um, uh, objectives and was fascinated by these animalcules, small moving animals in ponds of water. So Hartzerker was really interested to think what there might be in seminal fluid. And he said to Van Leeuwenhoek, had he ever examined seminal fluid, and Van Leeuwenhoek apparently was outraged. So Hartzerker went home. He was only about 19 at the time. And as soon as, he, as soon as he could, he examined a specimen of his own seminal fluid down his microscope. What he saw were these wriggling creatures which made him so frightened he assumed he had some kind of disease. And it's said that he didn't look down the microscope for the next two years. Whether that's true or not, when he finally published his great book on microscopy, which was certainly respected by the members of the Royal Society, indeed von Leibniz wrote, wrote to London about it, he showed this woodcut in the front of the volume, which is a specimen of a human sperm with an homunculus in the center of the sperm. And the interesting thing about the homunculus is that it is complete with its fontanelle, its fingers, its toes, and indeed so much so that there was an interesting discussion that von Leibniz had with the Royal Society. He said, we can now see that the sperm contains a little man inside it, which is so perfect that if it's a male, it will have little testes. And that's interesting, he said, because if it's got little testes, inside those testes will be sperm, and half of those sperm will be males. So inside them, there will be little males. And so this goes right back to creation. Von Leibniz, though a mathematician, was of course deeply religious and believed in creation. Why I'm interested in this woodcut is because of the ethical issues that it produces. Indeed, one of the fundamental questions by this picture is that if there's really a little man inside the sperm, then the destruction of the seed by masturbation, for example, is clearly something which is reprehensible, indeed rather wrong. And indeed, a rabbi, uh, Pinchas Elijah ben Meir, writing some 80 years after he'd read the volume, wrote this, and I've translated it from Mishnaic Hebrew, so forgive me if some of the words don't quite make sense. But he says that it's been seen through a viewing instrument, which was called a microscope, that a drop of man's sperm, he means seminal fluid, whilst yet in its original temperature, he means environment, contains small creatures in man's image. And therefore, he goes on to say, that the Talmudic idea of hash hatat zera, which I haven't translated, but hash hatat zera means destruction of the seed, zera is seed in Mishnahic Hebrew, is like murder. And if you think about it, the ethics of that statement are impeccable. If there are little men, in a sense it is like destruct, destroying human beings. The problem, of course, is that the ethics of that statement are only as good as the underlying science. And as we learn about the natural world around us, my point, of course, is that our ethics have to change to take in that learning. No rabbi now, I think, would regard the seed potentially like the chair itself, for example. No uh, modern Jewish scholar studying Jewish law would argue that that was really an issue. Now, that's important because when I was first doing in vitro fertilization, 
I came under huge pressure from people who felt that what I was doing with embryos was so seriously wrong, it was really like murder. And indeed, I was accused of that repeatedly in the media and face-to-face -face on television. Because, of course, it was said that life began at fertilization, which some religious authorities still believe. That's a philosophical problem because, of course, this wonderful experiment by Kono in Japan shows that it's possible to get fertilization in a mouse. This is the mouse mother, and these are her offspring, without the egg ever being fertilized by a sperm. In fact, these eggs have been activated simply either by immersing them in the wrong pH, in the wrong acidity, or more prob probably by pricking the egg with a pin. So the interesting thing is, although, of course, the offspring, i.e. this mouse, which is an offspring, one of the uh, fetuses that survived in spite of the misprinting of the imprinted genes, this fetus which survived obviously has to be female because it's not coming in contact with sperm, it can't be a male because the Y chromosome is carried by the sperm, but it can have, after fertilization normally, these pups which may be male or female. And the question really is, is this mouse, does it exist? Is it a figment of Conan's imagination or is it really a mouse? I think most of us would argue that this is a mouse and actually this is an example of life beginning without fertilization. However, that was not easy um, argument to be accepted. I want to just set that scene before moving on to what I think are the basics of ethics. I don't intend to give a lecture on conventional medical ethics to you. Other people could do that very much better than I. But this paper by Beauchamp and Childress is very well known, and it argues essentially there are four key points looking at our ethical attitudes when we treat patients. The first is the respect for the patient's autonomy. The second is really to try not to do harm. The third, of course, is to try to do good. And the last is to attempt to find a just solution to the problem that the patient and society is faced with. And those are issues which, in fact, will come through this talk uh, throughout. So autonomy sounds wonderful, that we respect the patient's autonomy, which of course means obviously informed consent, adequate communication, um, proper deliberation with the patient about their condition and their treatment, uh, no deception, telling the patient of the truth, which I think is an interesting issue in medicine, um, and of course respecting the patient as a person. Uh, beneficence and non-maleficence are obviously obvious to all of you in this audience, but they include weighing up the risks of the treatment against the benefits of the treatment and trying to provide something which on the whole provides benefit rather than harm, trying to ensure that when we promise a benefit, it really isn't a paper promise, and of course recognizing that sometimes beneficence isn't always clear cut. For example, one of the clear cases that might be true is not the issue of a mastectomy, maybe in somebody who's got a gene which might give them a very high risk of breast cancer, but no guarantee of breast cancer. And of course, what comes into that also is effective medical research, which some of us might regard as a moral ob obligation, but is actually beset with problems in an ethical framework. How we may or may not actually do our research with clinical patients, whether or not randomized controlled trials can be done without uh, risk to patients and so on. With regard to justice, that's something which I will increasingly want to focus on in this lecture. It seems to me that that is a real issue for health services around the world today. And one of the things that I will want to discuss with you, though I can't come to any clear cut conclusions, is that worldwide we face healthcare which is more and more expensive and more and more less under control 
of governments and less and less well controlled by, by governments. And I think that's one of the issues which I think is a very real ethical issue in practical terms. And Ranon Gillon, who was an academic in ethics at Imperial College London, where I come from, added a fifth category, the category of scope, which is really what are normative values, um, who has a right to life, actually we might add who has a right to death in current discussions, is there a right to have a child, for example, in in vitro fertilization? Clearly, in, I think most of us would argue there's no right to have a child. You cannot have a right where that cannot actually be enforced. And clearly, uh, the right to have a child is not within the scope of medical care. Now, it's amusing, perhaps, to look at some medical attitudes towards some of, the, some of the attitudes of the public to some of the uh, concerns of people about the research we do. So for example, this poll which was done by Murray some years ago uh, seemed to conclude that 80% of the population from questionnaires regarded it as acceptable to do research on human volunteers, but only one third thought it was suitable on rats and less than one third on a bacterium. I've no idea how the poll came to that conclusion. It might be, of course, the idea of genetic modification of bacteria, but I have to say this poll was taken before synthetic biology was really very firmly established as a key scientific endeavor. The history, of course, of um, seriously adverse research on humans and worse, and the lack of treatment of their autonomy goes way back. It certainly does not start in Nazi Germany. In fact, probably the eugenic movement starts in this country with Francis Galton. And Francis Galton believed in the survival of the fittest and believed as a cousin of Darwin that we should be trying to preserve that to make sure that our society was better in consequence. I don't intend to talk about the eugenic movement in any detail. What I want to argue with you is that eugenics is as serious an argument now as it ever has been. This poster, of course, taken from around 1936, is saying that it costs um, 60,000 Reichmarks to keep this person with hereditary disease alive uh, of uh, laboring site. And it's arguing people should read the Neues Folk uh, to see actually what the truth of the, of the argument is. Now, 60,000 Reichmarks, I've looked up how much that's worth in uh, contemporary uh, money. So at the time, it was worth about $140,000. So in present time, we're looking at something like about a third of a million to keep this individual alive. The argument, of course, is very clear to us with the hindsight of our um, perfect society. I want to argue to you that it's not so far-fetched to consider that in a world which is beset with climate change, with conflict, with water shortages, with food shortages, with lack of education, with fundamentalism, that we could see easily that actually a eugenic argument could again strike a chord. It's never, in my view, gone away. And I think it is remarkable to consider that after the Holocaust in Germany, we in this country, and by that I mean the United Kingdom and Scotland, including Scotland, were sterilizing people without consent, as they were in California, and indeed in probably the most liberal democracy in Europe, in Sweden. In fact, 40,000 women were sterilized without consent. In the Carnegie Institute, we see this rather revealing that's funny, oh, there it is, my laser pointer had gone. Um, uh, uh, microscopic, this is a, a carrier type done by a scientist in the lab. You can count the number of chromosomes. 24 pairs, which is more than there are, of course, in the human genome. So we can date this as being about 1952 when I was first learning biology at school. And the supposition is that the microscopist can tell the difference 
by looking down the microscope between a Negro and a white. It's worth bearing in mind that at that time in the United States, there were still criminal laws against mis miscegenation. So for example, it was considered a criminal offense for a black to sleep with a white in 36 states of the United States of America. In fact, in Virginia, that law was only repealed in the late 1960s. And that racism is something which, of course, is not founded in any real evidence, but it also tells us something about scientists. It's my contention that all of us as scientists will see down the microscope or on the gel what we want to see. We are as objective as non-scientists. We are subjective as non-scientists. And we'll likely be, per be persuaded increasingly, of course, by our urge to be right and by our urge for what we see as the truth, which I think is actually something which we are inclined to forget when we like to believe that we are above this kind of bias. I don't think that that's true. When I was a young medic, now this is published in 1977, so I would have then been a senior lecturer, which in England carries consultant status. So I was a consultant when I published this little paper in the British Medical Journal. I don't rate it as a great paper. It's not, it's not the point. But at that time I was doing quite a lot of corrective surgery for women who were requesting reversal of sterilization. These women had come to my clinic because of the techniques we were using. And actually, the paper only describes the first 103, but I saw nearly 300 of these women in a short period of time. Pretty well, ladies and gentlemen, all these women had been sterilized because they had requested a termination of a pregnancy. And the pregnancy was terminated on condition that they were prepared to be sterilized. Some of these women were teenagers. Some of them were 19. One or two were 18. And of course, not surprisingly, this damage to their whole being as women was monstrous. In fact, very few of those women were actually in later years, and not many of them had had more than one child. Some had had two, one or two had had longer. And it struck me when I looked at this paper again recently that I suddenly remembered again and again when I was a surgeon in training doing caesarean section for women who were having perhaps a fourth baby, that it was not uncommon for my consultant to jokingly say, well, of course, if you take the Spencer Wells forceps and crush the fallopian tubes by mistake, she's had four children already. She can't really afford any more anyway. This is not such a bad thing to do. There was that kind of notion which is close to eugenics in a very democratic society. So I don't think that has ever gone away, and I think it remains a real risk and might be an increasing risk given certain uh, perturbations in society and with the increase of certain technologies, which I'll come to. This was published in, I forget which newspaper, uh, this July, and it's the governor of this prison in California saying, well, of course, actually, it's cost us $147,000 for our sterilization program from these inmates. But when you consider how much it costs for these people to bring up a child, it's nothing to the public purse. This is worth doing. There's no suggestion, of course, that these women were sterilized with any form of consent, as indeed we know they weren't. So this is happening even in that great democracy across the Atlantic. I can't but avoid uh, uh, talking about, I can't but not avoid talking about my own field. One of the things that really concerns me increasingly now that I've retired from active reproductive clinical medicine is the massive cost that is used for the treatments, not only in England, but also in America, most parts of the continent, many other parts of the world indeed. So for example, a typical charge, and these are two private clinics in London, charging uh, for in vitro fertilization, two and a half thousand pounds and three and a half thousand pounds. Notice that 
To store an egg or embryo in liquid nitrogen is charged at around 250 pounds to 350 pounds a year. The cost of liquid nitrogen, as you will know probably, is a few pence per liter. And you might need to change that flagon of liquid nitrogen every two months. So the cost of that treatment is hideously exploitative. I've looked at what it might cost to take a basic unit, where the most expensive thing undoubtedly the salaries, and you, you can see that to deliver the basic costs of in vitro fertilization are probably under 700 pounds, providing you have enough patients. Why does this matter? It matters increasingly because we are facing more and more privatization of medicine. I know it's not happened in Scotland yet, but it's certainly happening in, in England. And it's happening particularly, of course, in our National Health Service. And the National Health Service has never costed out what it costs to deal with the infertile patient. I know that from running a unit. And so, of course, many NHS hospitals are charging far more than that sum in their costs because, of course, they make a very handsome profit from that treatment. My own unit was making millions for Hammersmith Hospital by the time I retired. That is regrettable because as we pass that treatment on to private providers, we will increasingly be expected, the public purse will be paying for what it is thought the market will bear rather than what the cost of the treatment is. To my mind, that is a massive ethical issue. It's a massive ethical issue which is compounded by this horror. This is a regular advertisement in the London underground. I'm given to understand that it costs about 35,000 pounds every two weeks to advertise on London transport. Here you see a clinic offering fertility for over 40s. That, of course, is freezing eggs, a very poor technology, which has all sorts of risks and very few advantages. Mostly is not likely to work without going into the mathematics of it. And of course, we know that this is deeply exploitative of the women who are being treated. This, I think, is extremely worrying indeed. And the consequence of the high fees in this particular area of medicine means a lack of equity in healthcare, extra cost to the health service, um, a, 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 a recognition that IVF is so suitable for treatment that we don't make a diagnosis anymore, we treat the symptom rather than the underlying cause. Um, so success rates are limited. We have unproven treatments and research treatments being charged for increasingly, such as pre-implantation genetic um, uh, screening. We have patients being sent by British clinics overseas where that clinic is, is, would be offering something which would be illegal in British law. And of course, most importantly, there's therefore a pressure for multiple embryo transfer with extra cost for the twins on or triplets on the health service and very importantly a failure to recruit good people into academic medicine because frankly it's easier to earn a very good living in the private sector. What I think is rather shocking is that organizations like the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority sign up to this kind of misinformation for patients that's also an ethical problem. They are there to police ethics. But here they say, for example, the biggest risk of fertility treatment is a multiple pregnancy. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest risk of a fertility treatment is failure of the treatment. And that is something which we have to recognize that two thirds of patients going through this treatment don't succeed. Enoch Powell, my old adversary, during the embryology bill that he introduced in 1985, argued that any research on the embryo was repugnant. I was surprised that somebody of his undoubted integrity and huge intellect would feel that strongly, whether it was because he'd switched out of the Tory party in London and had gone to represent a Catholic community in Northern Ireland, I don't know. But um, it was really shocking 
to see how he could produce a bill which was the protection of the unborn child. The unborn child, of course, is the embryo, which, as we know, has a success rate of implantation per embryo of around about 18 to 22 uh, percent. Most human embryos do not implant in the uterus, even when transferred under ideal conditions um, at the pre-implantation stage. One of the things that fortunately got more lax le legislation through was unquestionably nature's coverage of this paper of ours in the week of that debate in Parliament when finally the HFEA bill came up before the House of Commons. This photograph of a human embryo is taken with time-lapse photography, which I'll show in just a second. And what um, you can see here is a technique for looking at the individual DNA in individual cells, um, which we did by removing a single cell from the embryo. Um, the week uh, that this work was published with the first pregnancies was actually the week that Nature rather surprisingly decided to publish the data. And here you see a little hole being made in the embryo which becomes transfixed. Of course, this embryo is invisible to the naked eye, and this sucker is too small to be seen by the naked eye as well, these glass pipettes. And this technology, which um, was used to do single cell polymerase chain reaction by hand by Alan Handeside and myself at Hammersmith led to the diagnosis of uh, genetic defects and therefore our ability to decide whether an embryo had a specific defect which might be screened out given a clutch of embryos from the same patient. That injury is in fact not serious. Um, because although we've lost a cell, all these cells, of course, in the embryo are totipotential, and so the removal of one single cell at this stage of development is not an adverse event. The first two babies, who are now 23 and a half, Lisa and Harriet, um, are here on this photograph. The press, of course, called them perfect babies, which they certainly are not. They have one base pair difference from the deletion, the single pair deletion, which killed their elder brother, aged three and a half. The other three billion are not screened for in this technique. And Lisa, of course, actually Harriet, I should say, doesn't even, she's not free of blemish. She's got this thing on her chin, which isn't because she lost a cell at the, um, at the biopsy stage, it's because she fell over just before the photograph was taken. At that time, almost coterminous with the publication in Nature, just about two weeks beforehand, Paul Johnson, in a rather right-wing newspaper, published this, that this diatribe against the work we were doing. He didn't know that we were going to be able to treat patients who had watched a baby or a young child dry of a hideous disease. It's worth looking at the language because we need to be aware of language at all times as members of the public, as non-scientists, and as scientists. I've highlighted in white the relevant words. So the idea that the embryo is a child in the womb is nonsense. It's not, of course, literally at our mercy. It is never 14 days old because the technology is really only for the first few days. It's not on a colossal scale. The benefits are not uncertain because, of course, two weeks later, we were able to announce not only that pregnancy, but two others in the paper in Nature. Um, we have reinvented human sacrifice is a slur, but it's very difficult for a scientist to actually tolerate that kind of slur when it's so widespread in the public arena. Does it shock you? As high priests of progress, we've consigned our opponents to reactionary perdition, betraying the moral laws of our civilization. It's hard to take that kind of criticism, which it seems bizarre now, only 13 years later, was so, so, so prevalent. It's extraordinary how that has changed. Worse still is this. This is published in the 
one of the greatest journals in the world, Science, by Humphrey Lodish, a very distinguished molecular biologist. And he says of our work a few years later that it's now possible to take a single cell from the embryo, characterize the DNA, work out what proteins may be expressed or not expressed. Once we've got proper supercomputing, we'll be able to transfer the information about that together with information about the environment. And we will be able, he says, after computing, to make a color movie in which the embryo develops into a fetus before the embryo is implanted and show the mother, whilst the embryo is being transferred to her uterus, a movie in which the baby grows up into an adult and speaks or sings. Now, I must say to you that it takes a little realization, at least six minutes, before you realize that actually this praise is complete and utter trash. It's the science delusion. Many of you will have heard of the God delusion, which I think is uh, odious in my view. I don't think the God delusion is a helpful title for a book from a scientist, nor do I think the science delusion is helpful for us to be so determinant either. I think we need to be much more reflective on what we're saying. But it's easy to see how one could be actually transported by one's, sense, one's own sense of power or influence. I now regard pre-implantation genetic diagnosis as a relatively trivial issue, which has helped a few families around the world, but it's not particularly important. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Dr. Francis Collins and Dr. J. Craig Venter. <laughs> Collins, who's looking very pleased with himself, and Craig Venter, who I rather like, looking very embarrassed, really, to be in the company. Interestingly, we often forget that the private sequencing of the human genome costs about one quarter of what the public one did. I won't trouble you with what President Clinton said at this announcement of the first milestone in June 2000. Tony Blair was on the line at the other end when this was broadcast. Tony Blair said, this tells us more about our humanity than any previous human achievement. Um, I would argue that perhaps in 1599 when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, that tells us rather more about our humanity, but it's arguable. President Clinton said that this is a map which is, more important, which is a map which is more important than any map ever drawn by humans. I would argue that actually the map of Washington, D.C. is a good deal more reliable. And of course, it's now fair to say that we begin to recognize that the human genome is actually only a part of the story, and the amount of benefit we've had from the sequence of the human genome is still receding. I'm not saying that it was a useless exercise. I'm glad it was done but a huge proportion of human genetics actually could have been done without it, including, of course, our work on pre-implantation diagnosis and many other examples of diagnosis. The cost of the genome sequencing is decreasing faster, faster than Moore's law. And it'll soon be a matter of time before, of course, we have the cost of a, a genome down to perhaps a thousand pounds. What is interesting is to consider what the public perception of that hype is. This journalist writing in The Observer this year in June, Carol Cabwalder, I've never met her, said that she had her genome sequenced. I suppose The Observer must have paid for it. And she says, look what it's told me. First of all, she has the gene for male pattern baldness. Well, that's interesting, but she could have looked at her father and her two brothers. She's got the sprinter's power gene, apparently. I notice that she doesn't run herself, so it's probably not a great deal of use to her. But she has that gene, which is in common with a large number of athletes. The gene, I think, should be in inverted commas. She has 
no knowledge of whether she has the genetics which might encourage later, late onset Alzheimer's because she decided not to find out. So although they looked for that um, area of genetics, she didn't ask the people whether or not she was more likely to have Alzheimer's or not. Very interesting. She has a mutation for galactosemia. Well, that's interesting too, but almost, almost entirely irrelevant given that galactosemia affects, I think, one in 16,000 of the population. Presumably, she's married already. So if her husband hasn't got that gene as well as a recessive, it's not likely to affect her children. She has no BRCA1. So she is under the impression that, therefore, she's not likely to get breast cancer, a rather foolish assumption in spite of what she says in the article. It actually reduces her chances of breast cancer slightly but her chance overall as a member of the British population is still a very serious risk. She has a gene in common with quite a lot of us in the audience, myself including, included, for increased waist circumference. And lastly, she has no gene for conscientiousness. So I emailed her saying, I was interested to see that you have no gene for conscientiousness um, do you think that affects your journalism? <laughs> she didn't respond to my ELO. <laughs> that issue, of course, is a very real issue as an ethical issue in medicine today. Just two weeks ago, some of you will be aware that researchers in Leicester described an experiment which argued that they could change apoptosis in the brain using a model. They didn't say what the model was on the Today program. They were studious in explaining the science rather well, I thought, but refused to say that the model was an animal model. Now, in my view, not to say it's an animal model is a dereliction of duty as a scientist. It's very important to be up there in front and saying, we are doing animal research, because it's essential indeed for our medical development. But more importantly, of course, they gave the impression that a cure for Alzheimer's might be pretty, pretty soon, in the next few years. Here we see Professor Markram just two weeks later, in fact, this weekend, saying that actually the search for dementia cures is fading rather than increasing. So given that this is a massive gene that most of us of my age group, and I'm sure that would apply to most people in this audience, are seriously worried about, does this present our medical progress in the most responsible and best way. There is, ladies and gentlemen, I would argue, a real risk to this uh, sense of uh, spurious achievement. In the field of cancer, you can see uh, from this paper that there is remarkably a growing, amazing development of anti-cancer drugs. In fact, we're looking over the last few years of around 900 compounds, some of them single molecules, uh, some of them more biological, uh, biolog so-called bio biologics. But unlike almost any other drug development, certainly it really does look as if the genome is helping us to understand cancer treatment. There's intense competition for cancer drugs. You'll notice that, for example, um, most of these drugs are competing with other drugs with a similar target in the genome. And um, this classification based on the primary molecular target means there are around 397 compounds which have been uh, looked at by Bergen in his review in Nature Reviews. This, of course, is important because you will be aware that each new drug which is licensed is costing around $900 million to produce. Perhaps that can be decreased to around 600 million, but it's a very serious issue. Because of course, clearly, one of the concerns is that as we get older and older, this paper from Mike Stratton from the Sanger Institute shows of course that at every stage of our lifetime, we develop more and more mutations which give rise to more likelihood of tumors. So that by the time we are in my sort of age group, those mutations are literally tens of thousands. Let's just take one example. Let's just take the BRAF um, gene with its interaction with CRAS. 
You'll be aware, I think, that last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a publication which showed that we could now treat melanoma in advanced cases with this remarkable magic drug by giving people with advanced metastases, which actually made the metastases rapidly disappear. It was heralded as a fantastic success. Indeed, um, in London, um, uh, uh, Richard uh, Murray said it was the biggest breakthrough in melanoma treatment in more than 30 years. But actually, when you look at the papers which are published, what you see is that the survival time after the treatment is still only just over five months. So the risk, I think, to our reputation is a very real risk indeed. The risk is, I think, the increased hope through the hype that we produce and, of course, the increased cost that we may be producing on the health service. This recent publication by Bupa, admittedly it's a private organization, but it's looked at the cost of cancer treatment in the NHS by millions, and the private sector is suggesting that from 2010, when the cost was 9 billion for cancer treatment, it's now up to over 15 million um, by the year 2020. And of course, one of the issues in our ethics, therefore, comes back to that issue of scope, how we decide with more and more drugs treating fewer and fewer conditions, we actually can find an ethical solution to that healthcare. I fear that that's going to be dominated, ladies and gentlemen, by the market. I don't know why I've got this slide, um, but it shows two of my embryologists during an IVF session in the days when we, yes, I remember, when we were doing egg collection by laparoscopy, well before ultrasound was possible. And um, Steve Hillier, who sadly isn't here today, but is at Edinburgh University, wonderful Steve Hillier was my senior embryologist. And we had an open tube, which I was sucking the fluid from the ovary and follicle to. I handed it to Steve. The problem was that this was a laparoscopy at the time of the LH surge at about three o'clock in the morning. I was very concerned that the patient was under general anesthetic. She'd been, it would take me an hour and a half to find the follicles in spite of the adhesions that she had around the ovary. And I turned to Steve briefly as I was looking down the telescope. Steve, what's the time? And he did this. <laughs> we lost the egg, which in fact, the other Steve here in this photograph found. We couldn't really transfer that. Um, luckily, we have one other follicle. We have one other egg. Amazingly, in the early days of in vitro fertilization, that fertilized. We transferred it, and the lady got pregnant with a singleton pregnancy. An extraordinary fluke. Two years later, I had an ethical problem because I was going through the supermarket in Golders Green, and there, to my horror, was Mrs. B with a carry cot with a baby in it. And I wanted to say to her, you know, it could have been twins, but I couldn't. I think one of the other issues which filters in with this cost of healthcare is the issue about how we harm ourselves. So for example, the UK has got the third biggest epidemic of obesity in the world after America and, the, and in New Zealand. And the question is, do we continue to treat people who smoke in Glasgow or drink in Edinburgh or are grossly overweight? Um, how do we actually handle that in a healthcare si system? I've always wanted to give a lecture where I could show a picture of Michael Jackson. <laughs> I've never done so before. But Michael Jackson had a diagnosis appended to him, which he finally admitted to. This curious white face was due to vitiligo. And it raises a very interesting point that is easy to forget. And one I think which is one of our most difficult ethical issues. Is it ethical, ladies and gentlemen, for us to experiment on animals? Here is a vitiligo mouse. And you might argue that for a serious genetic disease, that's a real issue. May we make that mouse, by modification, more likely to have vitiligo when vitiligo actually does not increase the risk of a melanoma because it turns out that uh, these patients do not develop uh, serious skin malignancies. 
in general with exposure to sunlight. They have inconvenience, they have disfigurement, and they have minor problems. And I think the whole issue of mouse experimentation, like any animal experimentation, is difficult. My own view, I think, has to be that, above all, our guiding principle has to be to try to save human life. But I think it is a very real and difficult issue. This coming Friday, I'm introducing a bill into the House of Lords for its second reading, which is the Medicinal Labeling Bill, which will require all drug companies producing drugs to label the packet very clearly that this medical product has been produced as a result of research on animals. You may disagree with that, but it seems to me that we must have a much more open debate about the use of research in animals in this country. In my view, I do not believe it will put people off having medicines. This certainly still applies to vaccines. Of course, with the reverse vaccinology, that will change. But virtually every single drug in the pharmacopoeia is produced as, mouth, as a result of mouse work. Most of the scientists I've taken opinions from before introducing this for its first reading were very much in favor. It'll be interesting to see what the reaction of the pharmaceutical companies is. I rather hope that they approve of it because they've been extraordinarily flaccid in trying to defend the use of animals, preferring to hide behind people like myself who are prepared to say that we do. This video is taken from a neighboring city which you'll be aware of in Scotland. This is Colton in Glasgow. And it's rather shocking that this environment results in one of the highest uh, losses of male life, for example, in anywhere in the world. In fact, the death rate in Glasgow for uh, adult males is, uh, is higher uh, per age than it is, for example, in Mali or Mozambique. Oddly, if you just cross over to Lindsay, you have one of the highest um, uh, success rates. The reason, the highest uh, longevity rates, the reason why I show this is because whilst we in great universities like in Edinburgh, are making massive advances in high technology medicine, as I hope we are trying to do at Imperial College as well, and Oxford and Cambridge, and University College London, and many other great institutions. We are shockingly bad at implementing research into public health. This, to my mind, is a massive problem. My niece, Rebecca Landy, who is a mathematician working at Cambridge, has analyzed the population of Colton and shown that after you've corrected for alcohol, for smoking, for obesity, for diabetes, this shortened longevity of males is really unexplained. In my view, it's most likely to be due, due to epigenetic changes. Another problem we have is shown very well in this slide of one of Michael Schneider's slides from an embryo in our laboratory. This is a single embryonic cell which has been dosed in a way to make it beat. This, of course, is now a cardiomyocyte. And it's very difficult as a scientist not to be transfixed by the wonder of that sight down the microscope. It's easy to see how we seduce ourselves into being more positive about what we're doing than really is justified. That wonder, of course, is, I think, a real problem for us. But I don't believe that it's wise for scientists, like my friend Richard Dawkins, to make statements about people's beliefs in the way that he does. The notice on this bus, there's probably no God, so stop worrying, is not correct anyway. There he is with Polly Toynbee. I sort of wonder whether this is one of his PhD students. I don't know. Um, that, to be fair, I mean, that's not in any slow on Richard, who I know to be a very happily married man. Um, but uh, the fact, of course, is that what little research is done suggests that people who are religious are less likely to be worrying than people who are not religious. The problem, of course, is something which is deeply disturbing. It's not a far stretch from this kind of campaign to actually suggest this on a London bus or this on a London bus. You must forgive me for singling out Islam, but the reason to do so is entirely supportive because, of course, it perverts actually something which is really important. And this certainty of the truth is something which is deeply disturbing. In my view, in many ways, our search in science is about our uncertainty about the natural world. 
rather like our religion is about our uncertainty. And actually, science, rather like religion, is sometimes at its most dangerous when we are convinced by our certainty. And that, to my mind, is something which is really important in terms of our ethics. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of this talk. I want to describe briefly an experiment which is not fully published, which has been accepted for publication, which I think is a very serious issue. These mice have been modified genetically. The father has a dominant gene for a black coat. The offspring have a brown coat because uh, Carol Reedhead and I have modified the sperm in the testis. Some time ago, we realized that we could really get very reliable transgenic technology by doing something much more simpler, simple than modifying embryos. And actually, for many years now, she and I, with my team at Hammersmith, and to some extent her team at Caltech in California, have been looking at ways of trying to get transgenics much more efficiently by modifying them using uh, viral vectors. In particular, we use a lentivirus, and this work will be published in due course. What's astonishing is that instead of having the usual success rate, which is 1 to 5 percent, we can actually get around, depending on how we modify the media and other things, we can get around 90 percent of our embryos actually um, producing, the, having the gene integrated that we're interested in. Uh, we think we can get more than one gene construct in simultaneously. And gene expression has now been shown up to the third generation. And it seems to work in large animals like pigs. Now, from a medical point of view, that's interesting because, of course, it opens the possibility again of xenotransplantation. It opens the possibility of being able to modify pigs' organs so that they're not seen by the human immune system. And we could modify the rejection phenomenon, hopefully, in time. But it also argues something extraordinarily threatening to all of us. And how do you regulate that? Because, of course, if we can really regulate the genome of a large animal and we really want to use modern eugenics, then we could change cognition. We could change strength. We could change all sorts of things, what we regard as desirable characteristics. This film clip of Hakimi's work in Chicago shows it rather well. The front mouse has been modified so that it uses oxygen very efficiently. And it runs much faster than the wild type mouse, which gives up after about 200 kilometers. The genetically modified mouse will run for an hour, but it keeps on going. Can it run for two hours? Well, actually, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it can run for two hours. Can it run for three hours without stopping? Yes, it enjoys it so much, it can run for three hours. Actually, this mouse was filmed for over four hours running on the treadmill. Interestingly, it uses much more carbohydrate than a normal mouse, and it is much more aggressive than a normal mouse. It's not the sort of mouse you want in your kitchen. It never gets fat, and it lives for about a third of its life longer. Unpredictable effects as a result of the genetic modification. I think that probably gives us some food for thought. Thank you very much for listening to me. So, uh, Lord Winston has uh, kindly agreed to take uh, a few questions. So, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand. Hi, um, my name is Marina Johnson. Um, regarding the bill you want to put through the House of Lords, um, you say that most drugs are tested on animals anyway. Why do you feel it's so important that this should be on the packaging? I think it's important that it should be on the package because I think that there's, there's a need for people to recognize how essential animal research, and particularly research on mice, is necessary for the progress of biology. What is interesting is that again and again there have been moves, particularly in Europe, to try and reduce the number of animals that we're using. If you look at the statistics which are published by the Home Office in London, there's a rise in genetically modified mice which are being made in laboratories, which are necessary, in my view, essential for the progress of much pharmacogenetics, and many other experiments which are needed for human health. 
I don't think that that's likely to decrease because although we talk about the three R's, reduction, refinement, and replacement, computer modeling, cell culture, and a whole range of other things cannot do what research in the intact animal can do. So in my view, what is important is to show that we are using those mice wisely and humanely, not excessively, but essentially to protect humans. And indeed, animal health as well. The relation, you, talk, you talk a lot about the public perception of, of science. Um, and I'm curious as to what you feel like the scientist's responsibility is for the kind of life that our findings take on once they leave our labs. And I think um, personally that the relationship between um, science and the media is pretty dysfunctional. And I was wondering if you had any insight into how to improve that process so we are ethically presenting our findings to the public in a way that's transparent and clear about uncertainty. Well, I, I'm not sure that the relationship between the media and the scientist is quite as dysfunctional as it has been in the past. I think there are lots of signs that it's improving, even that great organ of science, the leading scientific journal in the popular press, the Daily Mail, um, has been increasingly more responsible in its reporting. The classic example was the reporting of the Fuji, uh, uh, Fujiyama, uh, Fujishima uh, uh, example in Japan with the nuclear re reactors that were flooded. What was extraordinary was that Mike Hanlon, the science correspondent, had produced a series of really responsible argu arguments saying we mustn't look at that as a way to negate the need for nuclear power in the United Kingdom. I thought that that was an astonishing breakthrough in journalism. And in general, the dysfunction, I think, mostly comes from us as scientists. I think we are very ready to give the impression that things that we've done are much closer to fruition than they really are. And I think that that's dangerous. And journalists, on the whole, of course, want to be sensational. Of course, they want to attract the headlines. But good science journalists, who I think are on the increase, are very wary about hyperbole from our community. And I think, on the whole, they're doing they're printing what they're told to print rather than making it up. So I think the onus has to be on us. And the fact is, as I said to a group of students this morning, if you're a PhD student doing a PhD project, actually it wasn't to students, it was to colleagues here, if you can't explain in three sentences what your PhD is about to a non-scientist, it's possibly not worth doing. We are very bad at explaining the science we do, and that's a real problem we need to be much more concerned about how we express that, because if we express our science properly, we will actually do better experiments, in my view. Thank you. Um, David Stevenson from Queen Margaret University. I was really pleased to hear you question the concept that truth is, is absolute and to, and to move away from a notion of, or to, to point out the danger of certainty. And I suppose with that, Again, we're lucky in Scotland that we don't have the same funding situation that they have at universities in England. But I just wondered what, what fear you saw for science in the removal of funding for the humanities, and to what degree should STEM subjects actually be saying that language and the work of humanities and the work of kind of critical language studies are as important to our scientific research as the science itself? Well, I take the wrap up the wrap over knuckles, which is implied by your question, uh, to heart. Um, but I do think that science um, is not necessarily going to be the answer to many of the questions which, with which we're plagued, the expanding universe, the black hole, and so on. And there are many things which we're not going to be able to explore. Increasingly in biology, I think there's a growing recognition that quantum is going to be quite important in biology too, which is quite mysterious. Um, I don't know how we get around that. There needs to be, that's why universities are so important. The problem I have working at Imperial College, as you understand, is that it's a science university. It's rather unusual in the British Isles in that respect. Very good science, but not great humanities. I think that's a huge lack. It worries me massively that in the budgets which have been presented to research councils, um, 
the humanities have come out much worse than they should have done. Because ultimately, of course, the humanities are of key importance in how we deal with our science. And that, I think, is deeply troubling. Um, of course, we want to see more science research being done properly. Of course, it should be properly funded. Nobody argues with that. But I think the worry is that we have a score to hit at the cost of the humanities is very, very serious. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering what, um, I have actually three questions, four, but I'll stop at three. Um, I think you might get you into trouble with the principal. <laughs> one, one, you, question. one question. Um, you didn't say anything about genetically modified food. No, I didn't say anything about genetically modified food because I think it's an essential technology which we need urgently. Um, the evidence that genetically modified food is in any way harmful to humans is completely absent in my view. I mean, I know I'm talking in absolutes, but I've not seen any good data to suggest that it's really harmful. And we're living in a, on a planet where cereals are threatened by pestilence and by drought. Many are killed at the time when they are most mature, when they've used most of their water. And we have a duty, I think, to pursue that technology. What is really an affront to rationality is that in England, at least, I don't know how it is in Scotland, but in England, researchers doing work on modified crops get assaulted and their fields torn up by protesters, which is, I think, very shocking. Um, I would like to see more research. There are some environmental issues. I suspect they're much more trivial than some people are prepared to believe. And indeed, certainly what's been published in uh, leading journal Nature has shown on several occasions that the risk to the environment of genetically modified crops is far less than has been stated by its opponents. So, um, so I'd now um, like to propose a vote of thanks. Um, um, me understanding medicine, understanding recent developments in genetics is really quite demanding. Uh, and uh, Robert has talked about uh, these developments, and he's been a, one of the key scientific leaders in some of the very important developments in medical genetics. He's talked about these uh, with tremendous clarity. Uh, putting these developments in a societal context is also very demanding, but he has very successfully, in his very clear lecture, put them in a societal context. And then, <clears throat> for many of us, um, talking in a clear and honest way about ethical issues is a tremendously hard thing to do. And I think it's a tremendous credit uh, to Lord Winston that he talked about medical genetics and societal issues and their interaction with pos possible ethical views uh, with such great clarity, such obvious uh, personal integrity. And so I now invite you to join me in applauding him. Thank you very much. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.